HRS 2024 in Boston, day two wrap up starts now. This is Heart Rhythm TV and we are here together. The Heart Rhythm TV crew keeps getting bigger and bigger and hopefully better and better to bring you the summary of today's content. The summary of today, it's numerous. There were so many different sessions. We're gonna end with science, but start with the general feel of the conference. Julie, how did the day start with our open plenary? We uh, kicked it off with our open plenary this morning. Well, wait a second, and, uh, what? Julie. What? Where's your hat? You're talking about the plenary? Oh, the plenary mm -hmm. session, yes. There we go. There it is. Yeah, ready to roll. <laughs> yes, we started off the plenary this morning, and we had a fife and drum band that came, and then uh, my colleague, Dr. Tridman, and I got to do a great opening introduction, and uh, I was a dunking. It was great. And then we introduced Dr. Colby Salerno, who is a cardiologist who actually had hypertrophic myopathy, and he told his very moving story about how he got a defibrillator. At, he was diagnosed at age 12, got a defibrillator at age 14, and has kind of dedicated his career to um, promoting uh, heart wellness. And then that was followed uh, by Pat Kit got up and spoke, and Mina Chung, and then the keynote speaker was Jag Singh, who uh, talked a lot about remodeling healthcare and talked about um, where we're moving toward in the future with virtual care, sensor-aided care, uh, AI, developing sustainable workflows and clinical outcomes. So it was really, it was a great opening plenary for the day. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, and I just want to put a special shout out to Jag. I mean, what a brilliant job. Really spoke from the heart. He's, of course, you know, really taking this issue uh, at heart and he really believes in it. And I think there's a lot to learn from what he said. And it was just a wonderful way to end an amazing hour this morning. And great to have a keynote speaker be one of ours, right? So that it shows you how global his appeal has been. He's been traveling the world. He's been in Good Morning America and talking about you know, the future of virtual care and, and how we need to change everything. Then we went to a cardio neural session. Yes, for sure. And the cardio neural ablation session gets some news and some interesting subjects. Dr. Shikumar gives us complexity of the anatomy and what should we be careful of the cardio neural ablation. The way was followed by Dr. Tolga Aksu, who described the AV block denervation. Consider from that, Dr. Roman Biotrowski actualizes the research right now, and we have two randomized controlled trials. And Dr. Pachon gave us information about the pitfalls, how we can get stuck and compromise the results, and very important stuff about the learning curve. So much new information in this yeah. relatively young and almost brand new field to many that have not been exposed to it. So that's always a packed room there. And then, Clint, you went to the AFib guidelines wrap up. Yeah, in November of last year, we finally got an update to the AFib guidelines. This is the most common arrhythmia we see. Most of our patients feels like have AFib, and we really needed to update with the most recent clinical trials since the 2019 update. So. We went through that. We talked about the higher indications for ablation pretty much across the board, especially heart failure patients now with a class one indication for early ablation. Symptomatic persistence, not just paroxysmals anymore. There is a higher recommendation now for the watchman or the um, left atrial occlusion devices, mostly the watchman as far as market share goes. Um, and uh, some nuance too to the anticoagulation decisions. It's not just Chad's Vasque anymore. Yeah, and I think that <clears throat> The part about lifestyle modification within the guidelines is also more and more important now with a, a longitudinal ongoing intervention in addition to early ablation, which I think is, is so important moving forward. And going back to what Dr. Singh had mentioned this morning, the health of our healthcare system should not depend on the sickness of our patients. And so it's a really nice way to bring the preventative and the interventional part together. No, I completely agree. I mean, I think it was a big guideline for ablation, but also a big guideline for thinking about AFib as a continuum, intervening upstream, right? Multiple stages of AF, and then a class one recommendation for 210 minutes of exercise. I mean, so, I mean, really, what a great guideline update from so many different angles. The other thing that struck me about the conversation around these, these new guidelines are the onus on us, really, to make sure it's disseminated. Our primary care colleagues, our general cardiology colleagues, a lot of them see AFib patients before, before they get to us. And so emphasizing the higher you know, data we have now for early ablation is important. Yeah, the messaging is so important because the data has never been better for all the things that we're passionate about 
we're reversing heart failure with pacing, we're reversing heart failure with AFib ablation. Sinus rhythm is therapeutic, and you're right, it's part of the mission for HRS and all of us is just how do we better deliver these messages to the general cardiology community as well as internists. And I think as allied professionals, we make a huge impact on lifestyle modifications. That's, that's where we, we can really make an impact for our patients. And then yesterday was a lot of PFA, and today was PFA all day as well. I think it's rosé all day's usual theme, but this is PFA all day. So we saw a lot of really interesting late-breaking science coming from it, registries, randomized trials. Dan, what did you like there? You know, PFA all the live long day. Um, you know, I, I, speaking of good data, you know, I just came out of the lattice catheter, dual energy, uh, RFPF study, approximately 420 patients randomized controlled trial. We're comparing in early persistent patients the dual RFPF approach with a traditional thermal base ablation, ablation with RF, okay? Uh, interesting things that, that came out of me was the catheter design, the ability not only to deliver dual energy, but also to high density map from your catheter. So we always are kind of, we're focusing on costs, we're thinking about, you know, how do we translate this well? And that was a really, really nice thing, was you're able to high density map and deliver. So in the, so for the results of that data, um, you know, definitely not inferior, okay? Um, I think we're in the 60s, uh, mid 60s for your traditional RF, and then in the mid 70s for your dual RF PF, Missing the kind of missing the threshold for superiority by one percent. So really, and clear separation in those Kaplan-Meier curves. So I think a really, really exciting new tool for armamentarium, and another you know offering where now maybe we we might be able to focus on cost a little bit by eliminating the need for a mapping catheter. And then consistent data with registries, Admire. Faradice as well, showing real world outcomes, safety, efficacy, pretty consistent with what we're seeing. So again, looking very strong and I think there's many people that say, oh, we're doing this and, and this PFA has been a great experience so far. Obviously, we're still looking at hemolysis, spasm and all the other things. So there's still, still reason to be able to mitigate some of the safety risks as well. I agree. And then conduction system pacing is always, always hot. We didn't see a lot of stuff about leads going in, but we saw stuff about leads coming out today. Yeah, absolutely. And the CIED session was the first late-breaking clinical trial session today. So we, uh, Dr. Vijayaraman presented on the experience with extracting left bundle area pacing leads and his bundle leads. And the leader trial was looking at the luminless ICD lead uh, modeled after the 3830, which Dr. Crosley from Vanderbilt presented. So really interesting data there as well. Very high, uh, good DFT testing, high 90s in terms of safety and, and early device complication rate was very low. So uh, I think that's that's a promising lead. And, and even though people keep having flashbacks to Fidelis, I think this will be probably a different experience. That really is breakthrough technology if we're miniaturizing ICD leads to 4.7 French. So I think that we're seeing a new revolution in terms of lead manufacturing as well, so that's great. And the segue, I think, is their next study is to understand that lead and conduction system pacing, right? And Absolutely. So, so, I mean, I think, you know, the beginning of the story to an even bigger story. Yep, the idea is to be able to deliver it with a sheath exactly where you want it and for it to be a capable ICD lead and provide conduction system pacing. But that's Hopefully. downstream. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there was a study, another late breaker by, presented by Tom Wong, looking at surgical versus traditional radio frequency ablation. Dan, you were there in that session as well. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I think that we, we, you know, long standing persistent AFib is a very tough substrate, right? And so in both arms, both very aggressive lesion sets where they're doing surgical ablation, uh, verifying block across the lines, epi and endo, as well as an aggressive catheter ablation lesion set, we saw 10, 12% you know, efficacy for um, the 30 second uh, recurrence. And then for a rhythmic reduction greater than 75%, we're looking at 50, 50 to 60% in both arms and equal. So really my thought was catheter ablation is your best option as a first line in that from a cost effective and patient uh, experience perspective. Which also highlights the need for continuous cardiac monitoring because the data was different depending on how much monitoring there is and we, we recognize that as well. Yeah, Arrhythmia burden reduction resulted in the improvement in symptoms. I mean that's what really mattered and that's what we should measure. 
Yeah, I was about to say the same thing. Last meeting, we talked a lot about that as a potentially more useful endpoint for AFib, right? Instead of freedom from AFib completely, are patients happy with the result? Is their quality of life better? And 50 to 60% for some of these patients who've had it for 20, 27 months straight, not a bad, not a bad endpoint, I think, based yeah, on where I mean, we've been. Uh, burden is clearly emerging as the, as the surrogate that we need to measure. The question is just how to be able to measure it reliably, but there's no question that's where we're headed. A very full day here in Boston on a day two. We are wrapping here tonight, but we had science. We had great sessions in terms of the new clinical innovations, both on the technology side as well as even just looking at different new mechanisms as well, new device innovation, miniaturizing ICD leads. Really exciting day, great plenary session. We're looking forward to day three tomorrow, and that's a wrap. Wait a second. Oh, no, 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 no. There's one more important piece. We have, we have video evidence of... Dr. Roderick Tung singing his heart out. I was trying to say that was a wrap, but. At the presidential reception show, let's cut to the tape. <laughs> Thank you. Is even more than anyone that you talk